Welcome back to another episode of Money Matters with Doug Jones, a personal finance show focused on moving you forward financially. I'm Doug Jones. And it's RSP season. And the deadline this year is March 1st. So a lot of people have got to be thinking about RSPs. Should you contribute? Should you not contribute? What are the benefits of contributing? Um, should you max them out? What do you do? What about tax-free savings accounts? A lot of people sort of think, well, maybe I should have a TSFA as opposed to an RSP. And so joining us today, we have Jason Kerr, he's a financial advisor at Edward Jones here in Barrie. And he's here to discuss all the benefits for us and to help educate us on the pros and cons of RSPs and TSFAs. So let's start with, um, uh, it, Jason, can you introduce yourself and what do you do at Edward Jones? Sure. Um, obviously, I'm a financial advisor with Edward Jones here in uh, Barrie. i uh, been with uh, Edward Jones going on almost eight years. Um, interestingly enough, um, I was actually watching BNN Market Call, and uh, one of the guests was uh, Keith Richards of Value Trend here in Barrie. Um, I went to his website and saw that he was hiring, so I gave Keith a call. And um, he said, I was really looking for somebody with more experience. I just graduated from university at that time. Um, but he said, look at Edward Jones. They have a great training program. Um, so I did that, and here I am, eight years <laughs> um, maybe one day I'll get to tell Keith that story myself. <laughs> so you must have, you must have, uh, you enjoy what you're doing. I do. Like, um, I made the decision, uh, when I came out of university, uh, my background is economics. Um, and I was lucky enough to sit down with the head economist of Royal Bank, uh, Craig Wright, uh, who's still the head economist to this day. Um, was able to get like an hour of his time, which like when I went there, my head was spinning, I couldn't believe where I was, um, but I asked him, I'm like, how many economists do you have? He's like, 15. I'm like, this is the biggest bank in the country, and you have 15 economists. So I kind of realized at that point that my, my economics career was not going to be something that would be practical. Yeah. Um, and so I, I decided to go uh, into investments, which was my passion anyways. Um, and so here I am, awesome. helping people. All right, so let's delve into our topic. So the first thing is, why don't we explain to people what an RSP is so they have a full understanding. So tell us about what an RSP is. Yeah, uh, an RSP, a Registered Retirement Savings Plan, um, essentially is uh, an ability that we all have as Canadians to defer income from one calendar year to another. So say we don't want to pay income on money that we made this year, uh, we can put that money into an RSP and then we can defer that income to a future time period. The only reason we would do that, or logically we would do that, is because we wanted to save money on tax. So to really understand the benefits of RSPs, to really understand what RSPs are trying to do, you kind of do have to have a basic understanding of the tax regime here in Canada, uh, understanding marginal tax rates and why you would want to defer income from one year to another. Right. So what happens is I put money into my RSP. I get a tax deduction this year. It gets to grow interest at, with no tax on the interest I earn in it. But then I'm going to pay tax on it when I withdraw my money. So effectively, the advantage of it is, or I think the logic behind it is, if I'm in a high tax rate now because I'm earning pretty good money, and I think when I retire I'm going to be at a lower tax rate, it allows me to invest money, save my high tax interest rate or tax rate now, have it grow, and then pull it out at a lower tax rate. Is that an accurate assumption? Yeah, I think uh, um, I would say everything, there's always caveats to it. There's always like uh, uh, different kind of things that you can do. Um, one thing that you can do is you can contribute to an RSP, but you don't claim the tax deduction this year. So the money's there, but you can use that tax deduction in the future. You don't necessarily have to claim the tax deduction in the year that you contribute uh, to the RSP. The government will let you know that, hey, you have unused uh, RSP contributions that you've put in, but you haven't put it on your tax return, uh, and that's your choice not to do it. Like, you'd rather do it when it's more advantageous. Uh, really, the question of RSPs is, how old am I? Where's my career going? Where's my taxable income going to go from here into the future? Because that will, you know, determine, you know, what and how I do uh, RSPs. Okay. And so 
what I always think that people want to understand pros and cons. So tell us the pros and cons of an RSP. Obviously, one of them is that you get a tax deduction in a high tax rate year, and you get to get the interest growth tax-free until you pull it out. What other the pros and what would be the cons to an RSP? Yeah, definitely one of the pros is the tax deferral mechanism, meaning, meaning it grows in there tax-free. You don't have to report on any of the growth in there. Uh, the growth doesn't create a taxable event, meaning it's uh, kind of dragging down, uh, acting like an anchor on your investments. Like it's allowed to kind of go in there and, and do its thing and grow over time. It's when you pull the money out of the RSP, that's the taxable event. That's when you get the tax slip and you have to claim it on your income taxes. Um, another a big con I would say is it's a terrible emergency savings account, right? It, it, it doesn't do a lot of these other things that we might want our, our savings accounts to, to do. Really, it's designed more for uh, retirement or deferring income to a year where you're in a lower bracket, which traditionally is when you're retired. So the big con would be that it, it really has a singular purpose or like a very kind of small focus, doesn't have uh, a lot of kind of other use outside of that. Uh, I, I agree with you on that assessment. I have people that come to talk to me who have had an economic challenge and they're saying, well, I have some money in this RSP. Maybe I should grab that RSP money. And I, I try to explain to them the cost of that money because you still got your regular income. And if you're already the ta uh, you know, near the top tax bracket, to go pull that money out of your RSP, I explain that you know, it affects your overall tax rate and that can be very expensive money to use to to cover a short-term uh, need. But there is another pro to it, though. I believe, I um, mean, you can explain it to the viewers, um, that if you're a first-time home buyer, there's an option where you could access some of that money. Yeah, I think uh, when the government probably initiated the RSP, <laughs> the first iteration of it was to for savings for retirement. But then they realized that as we progressed through time, uh, things happen to us, right? Like it's not a perfect, we don't live in a perfect scenario where we work for 25 years and then retire. People lose their job, things change. Um, so they wanted to kind of create some abilities uh, in the RSP to handle this. So the two big things that you can do are the home buyer's plan, which is a down payment on a house. Uh, you can also do it if you are buying a house for disability uh, for purposes. Um, another one would be the uh, lifetime uh, learning plan, meaning you could pull money out if you have to go back to school for retraining. Um, those are honestly like minor things. Most of us will never use any of those features inside of an RSP. In terms of saving money for, uh, for a down payment on a house, um, maybe we can go get back to that later when we talk about tax right. fees. Yeah, and, and, and I think we should mention that if you pull money out for, say, that, that home buyer's plan, there is a repayment plan or else there is a negative tax consequence. Yeah, every, every year for 15 years after that, you have to remember to put it on your tax. And if you don't put it on your tax return, the government will add it to it. <laughs> it, it is a bit of a, a headache to, uh, uh, to manage it. It's not as simple uh, as just pulling the money out. Like you ha the reverberations over 15 years, you've got to deal with it. Okay, so people understand merits and the RSPs are designed for retirement savings and there's a lot of statistics out there that show that as Canadians we're just not saving enough for our retirement. So how does one go about setting up the RSP? Well, I mean the RSP is open to uh, every Canadian resident. You don't have to be a citizen, you're a resident. As long as you have a social insurance number, uh, the government can kind of track how much uh, contribution room you're allowed to have in your RSP. Um, so to open one up, it's as simple as having a social insurance number and a valid uh, government photo ID. And where would they do it? Uh, I would imagine just about every financial institution in this country uh, offers RSP accounts. Um, I, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of any specific one that doesn't. I, I can't. Like, one. I can't yeah. think of one. But they can also come to a person like yourself to get them and, and various investment advisors. Yeah, when you come to uh, to an advisor, I mean, you're getting more than just a, an RSP. Like, you, you're getting a lot of planning as well and a lot of uh, kind of advice uh, along the way. So, But if you're just looking to basically open an RSP, like any financial institution pretty much offers it in this country. How about how much can people put into their RSP? Well, it's a percentage of your income, uh, so 18%, uh, up to uh, like a maximum. So if you make even... 
you know, uh, we'll use like a Toronto Maple Leaf. If you're Mitch Marner, like you don't have more RSP contribution than, than <laughs> like somebody else, right? Like uh, there is a max, I think it's 27,230 uh, uh, right now for 2021. Um, that's the max that you can, you can contribute to an RSP uh, in terms of room. You can contribute up to whatever room you, you've accumulated over your life. Right. I think that's an important part is that if you've been working for a bunch of years but have never contributed to the RSP, you actually have a large carry forward balance that people can see on their tax notice of assessment. <clears throat> and if they go to their notice of assessment, it'll show them their sort of their carry forward. And then that helps you sort of know, you know, there's the max for the current year, but let's look at the carry forward. You know, if that's if something happened in your life, you suddenly had some extra money uh, just so they were aware of how much they could contribute. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's an important number. That's why it's on your notice of assessment. Um, I, I kind of feel like I remember seeing my tax-free savings account contribution limit on my note, and then it was taken off. So obviously the government felt that it wasn't as important uh, to, to remember that number as it is your RSP contribution room. Right. And I again, going back to the point that we were talking about earlier, I, I believe that the government recognizes there's a challenge in Canada on how much money people are saving for retirement. And I think that they're, they're trying to emphasize the need for this because as a group, we need it. Um, okay, so how about spousal RSPs? We just, after trying to figure out all the tax issues around RSPs, you then throw another wrench in ability to add a spouse to it. Like it just adds to the complexities that RSPs uh, are really about. Um, and so spousal RSPs are the ability to kind of give an RSP or an investment account to a spouse, but you get the tax deduction. The account is in their name, and the idea is in the future when the money comes out, it's taxed in their hands, but the tax uh, deduction was given to you when you, when you contributed to it uh, or given to the other spouse. So uh, people use it, uh, really you would only use it uh, if there's a huge income disparity between spouses. Other than that, I don't really come across it too often where I would, I would recommend it or suggest it, but um, mainly it has to do with income disparity, disparity between spouses. Yeah, that's where I see it is the high wage earner um, switches the uh, contribution to their spouse because in retirement, the high wage earner had other investments, was going to be in a higher tax bracket. So it shifts some money and created an increased tax savings. Um, okay, so we do have to break here for a second. So what I'm going to do is before we go to break, I'm going to say that when we come back, I'd like to now start talking about TSFAs or tax-free savings account as an alternative to the RSP and sort of the pros and cons between the two and when you use each. So we'll see you right after the break. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. I'm Mallory, and I was walking home one night when an impaired driver hit me. He had been overserved in two bars before getting behind the wheel. If the servers would have called him a cab instead of serving him more alcohol, my life would be the same as what it used to be. I think servers play the biggest role in keeping us safe because it's up to them what state the person's in when they leave. Refusing service isn't personal, it's the law. Ready to move forward financially? And you won't want to miss Money Matters with Doug Jones here on Rogers TV. It's a personal finance show focused on getting you expert advice in all matters related to money. Welcome back to Money Matters with Doug Jones. So before the break, we were talking about RSPs, and we're talking today with Jason Kerr, who's a financial advisor at Edward Jones here in Barrie. So we're, I said when we came back from the break, we'd start talking about tax-free savings account. But there's one other point I think we should really bring up that applies to I, actually both of them, uh, Jason. I'd like you to sort of address. And that is the time value of money and why it's so important to put money into one of these plans earlier in life versus later. Well, the only, one of the only things that we can control it, uh, with our investments is how long they're invested in. We can't control uh, what happens in the market. We can't control uh, what happens uh, in the world. COVID, world wars, financial crises, people, oil outages, climate change, like these are things that we can't really control. 
but we do have some control over putting money into an investment and not touching it for 25 years. Um, and so, at least historically, the math shows that compounding interest is best used over longer periods of time. Um, and so leaving the money in uh, as long as possible, uh, you'll have the best result. Yeah, so I, I actually had a numeric example that I was reading, and it was a person who invested $1,500 a year <clears throat> from age 20 to 55. So it's $45,000 they put into it. And then another person says, well, I can't start till I'm 40, and I'll go 40 to 55, but I'll double it. I'll put three grand a year in. So they both put in the same 45,000 and it assumed the same rate of return on both. And the person who put 1,500 in for the longer period of time grows to like $118,500 versus the person who went from 40 to 55 only ends up with just under 70,000. So a, a, quite a significant spread, again, because what you're talking about is the longer the money's there, the compound of the interest. And so I just think that's an important point for the viewers to recognize as we talk about the two types of investments, because the issue will be the same for both. The longer you can put money in, the better it's going to be for you and your financial future. So let's jump over to TSFAs. What are they? So the tax-free savings account is a relatively uh, new account that was brought in 2009. So interestingly, like we talk about retirement planning being, you know, something that's done over 25, 30 years. But when things were done 25 years ago, there was no such thing as a tax-free savings account. So it wasn't really incorporated into your plan. So, you know, as in all plans, you have to make adjustments as you go. Um, so the tax-free savings account was brought in. Uh, the original contribution limit was 5000 annually. It is now 6000 uh, annually. Um, there was one year. Uh, the Harper government put it up to 10. Uh, that was a one-year kind of bonus. So the amount that any Canadian who's been above the age of 18 since 2009 uh, could potentially put into a tax free is 75500 right now. Uh, but again, if you were you know, 15 in 2009, you're your limit would be a little bit different. It would be a little bit lower than that. And so that's what they are. Tell us how they work exactly. Like you, well, you told us the limits and the age category, but um, do I get a tax deduction for them? How is it taxed when I get the money back? Talk, cover those issues for us. Yeah, the, the government treats the money that goes into the tax-free savings account as money that you've already paid tax on. Um, so the money that goes in there, you've already paid tax on. It's from that point on, once the money goes in, you no longer have to pay any tax on it, right? Like, that's what the, the tax-free savings account is about. Um, and so you don't get any tax deduction, nothing. But in the background, uh, the, your financial institution is keeping track of what you're putting in and what you're taking out because uh, the CRA wants to make sure that you don't over-contribute and take advantage of the fact that you don't pay any, any tax on your investments inside of a tax-free savings account. Right. So I think that's the huge advantage to them is that it's after tax money that goes in granted, but it gets to grow with no tax consequences. And when you pull it out in the future, you get all of the uh, money out free. There is no tax like the RSP gave you the tax deduction. It grows inside the RSP. But as you start pulling it out, you're paying tax then. So it was, a, as you know, it was trying to play with the marginal tax rates versus this one. It just gets to grow for free and you pull it all out tax-free. So the question I then have is, what's the benefit? Like, there's a lot of debate. Some people say, no, no, you should have an RSP. Uh, other people say, no, you should have a tax-free savings account. And other people say, no, it depends on your stage of life. So uh, I have two kids who are in university, and I can tell you that right now, it's both of them are tax-free savings accounts. And some people are going to go, well, why? And I'm going to let you explain that. Well, again, um, I kind of use tax freeze as like the default. Like that, that is what you should do until you've maxed out on it. And then when you've maxed out on it, then you need to determine where the next place is to put it. And then in terms of uh, like utilizing RSPs, it's very situational. It's very something unique to you and your situation because it's based off of how much income you make today how much income you're going to make when you're retired, when you pull the money out of an RSP. But also you need to incorporate the fact that how much money you're going to be making 10 years from now. That should also be incorporated. So the tax-free is kind of like uh, the first stage, and that's why maybe like what you're thinking is younger people tend to use it. Well, yeah, because they're really 
there's not a lot of complexities to their tax situation when they're younger. The complexities happen when they start getting further along in their career and they start earning more money. Uh, there's now more things on the table to, for them to deal with. So, and for uh, me, it's the tax rate because right now in university, they're at a very, very low tax rate. Any earnings they have that will generate RSP contribution room will still be there. They can utilize at a later point in time when I cross my fingers and hope they're making more money than university days. Yeah, but you could also say that um, because they're basically not making any money or they're a very low tax rate, that the benefit of the tax-free savings account isn't really being utilized because even if they made money, they wouldn't pay any tax or very little tax anyways. The benefit is because that money that grows in there, that kind of gets added to the amount that's allowed to be in your tax-free savings account. And so really, the idea is like when you're older, you you have like a tax-free that you can put a lot of money in, a lot of money you can shelter from the government. That's really where you're going to get uh, the most uh, benefit from it. Yeah, so for me, it's to help them with start early, time value of money, get investments in, doesn't create a tax deduction. So you'll start those now versus the RSP. Uh, okay, so here's another question. Um, we talked earlier, you raised the point that an RSP is not a good way of saving money for a short-term need versus a, a long-term retirement goal. So you don't want to be putting money into your RSP and then pulling it out earlier because of the negative tax consequences. Does the same apply to the tax-free savings account? Or if you pull it out, what are the consequences? Yeah, and that's the beautiful thing about the tax-free is there's no tax slip generated when it goes in and there's no tax slip or anything when it goes out. It it, it's a lot easier to, to deal with. It's not something that you have to remember or to put on your taxes or, or anything like that. Um, and so because of that, it's definitely a lot more robust savings vehicle in terms of what it can be used for. Much better for short-term uh, mm -hmm. stuff in the tax-free, absolutely. And I also believe that if you, uh, you mentioned the total limit that's available based on your age and how what the annual limits were, but if I pull money out, I believe my overall limits replenish. So I, I have the ability to top back up to my maximum in a tax-free savings, but in an RSP, I don't. Yeah, in, in an RSP, like once you take the money out, you never get that room back. It's gone. You used it. You never get it back. With the tax-free, when the money comes out, you get that room back the following tax year. Now, that was not exactly the first rule for the tax-free. Uh, people took advantage of the fact that you could go in and out, in and out. Uh, in the same year, but the, the CRA and the government nixed that pretty quickly because, uh, you know, you launch these things, you don't know exactly how uh, the people are going to use it. Very smart people are going to take advantage of, of loopholes or, or advantages. Uh, you got to close those things as quickly as you can, otherwise uh, they can perpetuate <laughs> over time, and, and the government did. So now if you take money out, you don't get that room back that calendar year. You have to wait until January 1st of the next calendar year before you get that room back. Okay. So we've kind of gone through the rules of both, and you've sort of said when you're sort of telling people start with their tax-free savings and then max that out first and then look for other things, do you try to get people to do both? Yeah, I think, uh, like, I would probably say that you can utilize the tax-free and uh, as your, like, main savings vehicle. The question of whether you make an RSP contribution is very situational, something that you need to determine uh, probably on an annual basis. And so it doesn't make it a good vehicle for you making monthly contributions to because it might not be advantageous to do that, whereas the tax-free uh, doesn't really matter in, in terms of that. So in terms of me saying, like, utilize the tax-free, it's more of just putting a place to go for the meantime until you find a better place for it. The tax-free is kind of like the default. Okay. So you said you would assess RSPs each year as to whether you should contribute. Um, is that for everybody? What happens if you're just a T Ford employee and got the same amount of money each? So I know I'm going to make X number of dollars this year. Are you still questioning whether they should put money into the RSP? Um, I think the determination still comes down to their situation, right? Like, and, and it comes down to the fact that, okay, well, this is what you made this year, but what are you going to make next year? What are you going to make five years from now? What are you going to make 10 years from now? That has to be incorporated uh, in the determination of whether you make that RSP. Because remember, you have a finite amount of RSP room. And really what you want to do is you want to place it in the year that it's most advantageous for you. So there is a bit of planning uh, involved with that. 
Right. And that's where an advisor helps them with that. Yeah, I think um, to, to get into like more complex and kind of seeing how this unfolds, I think it'd be very difficult for like an individual to be able to capture that. But um, you can do it. Like I learned about this too. Like, uh, so it's not something nobody can do. Everybody can do it. It just takes time. Okay, so we've compared the two. What sort of final thoughts do you have for people to sort of as their takeaway from watching this about comparing RSPs and tax freeze? Yeah, I think it's more uh, the comment on RSPs. I think tax freeze, like everyone, no one ever says anything negative about the tax free, right? Like I've never really said, oh, the tax free is terrible. You do hear stories time to time about people like RSPs. Uh, they I should never have done that. Uh, it was uh, better to put the money in the mattress. <laughs> like you hear all kinds of things. It's because whatever, whenever they did it, it was not advantageous. Like they, they didn't really fully understand what the RSP was about the marginal tax rate differences, about the benefits that the RSP is, is giving you and how to do it. Um, and so they get kind of flabbergasted when they pull this money out and then all of a sudden they have to pay a huge tax bill. And they're like, this is, why did I do this in the first place? Um, so that would be like my main comment is uh, probably uh, RSPs are a lot more complex than, than we probably give them credit for. Um, and just to, to be uh, aware of your situation and how to, how to do it properly. Okay, so if someone wanted to talk to you, to talk to you about uh, this in more detail, how would they get a hold of you? Um, probably the best place, uh, you could go to my website uh, at Edward Jones. Uh, I think it's edwardjones.ca slash Jason dash Kerr. Or you could just Google me, Jason Kerr Edward Jones, like you'll see my name. Um, from the website, you'll get all my contact information. And that would be a great place. Like, give me a call. I'm easy to talk to. All right. Well, thanks very much for joining us today. We really appreciate all your insights. And I'd like to thank the viewers for joining us again today. Um, and if you have any questions or comments about today's show or suggestions for a future show, you can send us an email by going to the Rogers uh, show page and click on the link and uh, you'll get through to us. So again, thanks everyone. Thanks again, Jason, for joining us today. I think it was a good talk on RSPs and tax-free savings accounts at the RSP time of year, and we'll see everyone next show. Thanks and goodbye.